Today, 1.2 million people a year uh, are admitted to A&E due to overconsumption of alcohol. This number has doubled in the last eight years. Today, the cheapest alcohol on the market you can find is 17p per unit. This means the average person can get drunk with a pound coin. This is partially because since 1980, prices of alcohol have fallen 44%. Over the same period, cirrhosis of the liver has risen tenfold. Moreover, in 2010, 6,317 people died due to alcohol-created liver problems. Liver disease has now increased by 25% in under 10 years. And the trend that one out of every four people, or aged between 16 and 24, who die, die due to alcohol-related problems. Yet this has much more than just an individual. In 2009, 26% of people said that drunken disorder is a major social issue where they live. In 2010, 45% of violent crimes, 37% of domestic violence cases, and 33% of child abuse cases, the perpetrators were drunk. Last year, 9,700 people were injured or killed due to drink driving. And alcohol-fueled crime cost 13 billion pounds, costing the UK in total roughly 25 billion pounds in social costs. First of all, we'd like to make it clear that we don't believe Britain's current alcohol misuse is acceptable. And we didn't really need a barrage of statistics to tell us that. However, we don't believe that minimum unit pricing would be good for Britain. I would first like to paint you two pictures. A group of friends gather around a dining table eating a hearty meal, a bottle of wine being passed around, and conversation and wine flows as they catch up on the week's events. After a while, the bottle is finished, as is the meal, and they head to bed feeling happy and secure. A man loses his job. There's no money to support his family, so he turns to the benefit system to feed them. With his self-esteem shattered, a sense of helplessness sets in. He turns to his only friend, Jack Daniels. As the first scene illustrates, alcohol can be enjoyed responsibly. A minimum unit price would unfairly punish responsible drinkers. And for the alcoholic, would reducing the price give him the motivation he needs? No, it would simply, simply exacerbate his problems. This is all the bad aspects of paternalism. The government has no right to dictate people's lives. We have freedom as an individual. And if an individual wants to do something, that's their right. If an individual does something that damages others, then they should be subject to penalties according to laws and not restrained by a nannying state. If it will really fit, um, hurt the people on the breadline the most, then why is it that those who are poorest actively ask for minimum alcohol pricing the most? I mean, in, um, in Springburn, Glasgow, that has the lowest life expectancy of anywhere in the UK, yet it is the place that, where the community leaders demanded out minimum alcohol pricing the most. There is a proven trend showing that if cheap alcohol is made more expensive, people will drink less of it. Um, a University of Florida study of over 30 countries showed an average of a 10% price rise led to a 4.6% drop in consumption. And furthermore, unlike what the opposition have said, minimum alcohol pricing is the only measure that lessens the burden on the average moderate drinker that still tackles the problem that they have agreed with us exists. But furthermore, I think what we have to say is the state has to do this. Um, it has to combat excessive alcohol consumption. Um, because um, not to do so would be a dereliction of the social contract. A British society since the modern era has been run on the principle that individuals cede some personal autonomy to the state in exchange for the welfare it provides. Maybe the welfare state is the culmination of this principle. It was, ta it was created to tackle the five giants of poverty, I think the squalor, want, ignorance, idleness and disease. Um, in order for it to do so, it requires the tacit consent of the people to, um, to, to cede some personal autonomy and to conduct themselves in a responsible manner. <coughs> During the 18th century's Industrial Revolution, the amount of gin consumed rose from half a million to a staggering 55 million gallons. So why the increase? Essentially, gin became the escape for the masses living in deprivation and suffering extensive hours in factories. For centuries, humans have misused alcohol in an attempt to achieve a temporary escape from their daily anxieties and hardships. This policy oversimplifies Britain's complex relationship with alcohol. It assumes that ultimately people destroy not only their lives but the lives of those around them simply because alcohol is cheap. It assumes the shocking high rates of alcohol misuse 
are unrelated to the general feeling of disenfranchisement, despair, and downright lack of aspiration felt by many people today from factors such as unemployment. Are we expected to believe that a simple solution to Britain's complex and entrenched problem of alcohol exists through financially punishing those who drink and by ultimately making alcohol prohibitively expensive without even targeting the cause of the problem? The idea I think seems to be underpinning your case is that we should think of alcohol um, as an addictive drug or as a poison. Is that essentially what you're arguing? that it's really a, a substance which has absolutely nothing to recommend it and basically that we should view with trepidation and, and a high degree of fear. Aaron, you gave, you gave a lot of um, sort of powerful statistics and factoids, but I'd, I'd be interested to understand where, where your arguments stop and how they relate to other, other things that people do which are unhealthy. You know, where, where are you going to draw the line? If, you made uh, quite a strong argument about the um, importance of uh, uh, collective responsibility and that uh, uh, we cede authority to the state by in response to the, the, the welfare. I'm just interested in, to know um, where you see the limits in, in that ceding uh, uh, to the state. Um, are there limits? We saw only yesterday uh, the London Port authorities uh, stop people swimming in the Thames because it might damage somebody's health. So where, what sort of limits do you see uh, in place? We're advocating mineral alcohol pricing because we think it's commensurate with the, the level of um, the problems which alcohol is causing. Preserving the principle of choice, as long as that doesn't harm another person. So the thing with mineral alcohol pricing is that someone can still go out and buy it. We're just making it... We're making it, the conditions around that less favourable. So, uh, uh, so alcohol causes uh, £13 billion worth of crime to happen, whereas someone being fat doesn't. It, there's, uh, there's a, that's where I draw the line. It is the, it's the extent of the social cost is so much greater in this case. No, we don't think alcohol is some kind of like evil drink. Um, alcohol is perfectly fun, and I'm sure most people in this room drink alcohol and find it fun. Um, it's just about being responsible. If it's the case that we have an epidemic of uh, um, alcohol-related crime and uh, A&E admissions, and if it is the case that uh, minimum pricing would be one of the measures that would significantly reduce that, is it really much of a price to pay for the responsible drinker to pay a bit more? I'm quite interested in this argument that somehow the rights of the minority are greater than that of the majority. What is the balance, again, between those two? Um, how, how bad does a minority have to be before you're prepared to actually restrict their rights to uh, provide uh, greater safety security um, to, to the majority? You started off by conceding a fair bit of ground, I think, in arguing that you think that there is a big problem with drunkenness. And through the course of your talks, uh, you described drunkenness in a very um, unfavourable light, inherently associated with poverty, social problems, um, you know, in your, your case of uh, the person who likes Jack Daniels. So really I wanted to ask you the same question as, as, as the other side. Do you think that there are any merits to drunkenness? Do you think there can be a happy drunk? Or are all drunks unhappy, destitute, unemployed people? There's nothing wrong with drinking responsibly, and that was kind of what we tried to, I tried to outline in my opening speech. So it's, drunkenness can be responsible? Not it, it's, it's, it's the minority that come along and drink for the sake of drinking and do it every weekend going out to get smashed and etc, etc, that are causing the problem. We don't think there is a limit where the majority can take away the rights of the minority. We think that rights should only be ceded to government when we either gain more freedoms as a result or when the safety of other people is in danger. And that is not something that you can hold alcohol directly responsible for. You can say someone got drunk and committed a crime whilst they were, they were drunk. Fundamentally, they still know what they're doing when they're drunk. And we don't think that the alcohol should be held responsible for that. We think the individual should be held responsible for that, for that under the law. I feel that I need to challenge this consensus which has been which was established right from the very beginning that we have a serious alcohol problem. 
We don't. If we measure against 1945, for example, we were just coming out of a huge recession and two world wars, and then we're the lowest level of consumption in Britain as we'd, that we'd ever seen. We're drinking much less than we were in 1914, so only slightly more than they were in about nine, the late 1980s, and we're actually drinking less than in 2002, and we drink less than the French, the Italians, the Germans, and most other European countries. So I think it's just that we feel bad about ourselves, and what we need to do is, if we stop blaming ourselves so harshly for this problem, I think we'll all end up, if you forgive me, in better spirits. Um, I kind of want to press the rich-poor divide, because I think that the proposition tried to evade it by saying it didn't exist, by saying somehow the poor were fine with this. But um, it does exist, and I think that's quite undeniable. So, I mean, John Stuart Mill said that um, any measures that imply economic sanctions for certain, or economic like, deterrence for certain activities assumes a uh, civilization that treats the laboring classes as savages and children. So I was wondering whether you think that the working classes need a sort of a more increased paternalism that somehow the ruling classes don't need, and whether is that simply an elitist opinion? On Liberty, um, the essay that John Stuart Mill wrote, has a very interesting um, part of it in Chapter 5. It says that the people, um, people are excluded from the sort of harm principle, which is, I think, what you're kind of getting at, um, if they were mentally incapable or otherwise ill or diseased. We are, in effect, taking that principle and extending it further. If, of course, we would love it if, in an ideal world, everyone um, made exactly the right choices. But when people have shown consistently that they're not making the right choices, they're not capable of making the right choices, then the state has to come in and create an environment when they can make the right choices. Uh, to the proposition you've still not fully addressed, I think, whether raising the economic cost of something can solve a deeply rooted social problem that we have. Um, you spoke about the huge problem and the huge costs that um, the NHS is burned with for alcohol and the sort of courts and things from alcohol related crime. But when you're talking about um, obesity and things that have been raised before, this is equal if not more than that and you haven't really been coherent as to how far this extends and as to why I, and to, as to why I don't really have a right to go and get pissed and lie down in the street. If people in poor areas of Scotland don't like cheap alcohol, why do we need a law to stop them buying it? Isn't it rather the case, not that, that, not that, that, uh, that this is a, a experts and self-appointed community leaders, you're not elected by anyone, deciding they know what's best for other people. Otherwise, if, if they just didn't like cheap alcohol, there'd be no market for cheap alcohol, and you wouldn't have a problem with it. So shouldn't you be unashamed of saying, actually, you're, you are taking a paternalistic line. You, you can't just leave it to people to make their own choices because they make the wrong choices. Seems to me that's the only way the argument makes sense. And then briefly, to the other side, Ah, so you painted a nice picture of um, a group of friends sharing a single bottle of wine over, over dinner and then going to bed, which is nice. But I'd suggest perhaps not an entirely representative picture of how most people in Britain drink. I think there's good evidence to, to believe it. It's not just about chronic alcoholics and the, the desperately poor people lying in gutters, but most people in Britain who drink regularly do probably drink considerably more than the optimum amount for their health. And so there's a case to be said. In that case, shouldn't we take action and even if it's only symbolic, by saying alcohol needs to be, have a minimum price, marked out as not just a normal product, but something to take seriously, that that will give us all a collective jolt. Isn't it true that over the past sort of 50 years, as the state has taken greater responsibility for the actions of individuals, those individuals have become less responsible themselves? And this is why we lead to the problem that we're in now. And basically, my question would be, should the state take on the responsibility of individuals? I find, like, for both sides, I find all, like, the prim and proper posturing about, like, the sort of dark fantasy of, like, the drunks, uh, like, just really weird. Like, we're having a debate about a group of people who you have made up as being, like, the standard bad guys. We need people to, like, uh, we need, like, to have this debate in, like, the real world. We need, like, people to personally connect and understand, like, how we use alcohol. You admitted that... Um, alcohol minimum pricing wasn't a silver bullet and that you kind of implied that it was going to be a supplement. Um, it's quite an expensive supplement, I've got to say. It's a waste of time, it's a waste of money and it's distracting us from the real problems. In British Columbia, where they did try it out, um, it, did, it supposedly reduced alcohol <laughs> consumption by 3.8% over a period of 20 years. And even that's mostly because of the recession. I doubt it's anything to do with minimum pricing. Um, what actually does work is providing people with better economic opportunities, better education, better access to health. And um, I think you're just being like ostriches, burying your head in the sand and being petty about this. There are real problems out there and alcohol minimum pricing won't solve it. 
if I'm being asked to where this principle extends, I'm sorry if I haven't covered this clearly enough, but I do, I refuse to draw a line in the sand and say, this is when we should intervene and this is where we shouldn't, because it's such a complex process. We have to weigh up the, the cost to our freedoms and the cost to our civil liberties with the, with the cost of not intervening. And it's a, it's a complex process and we have to do it every single time. In terms of harm, I would probably say um, we have two areas. We have harm to the individual, individual and harm to um, the rest of society. And so I think we weigh up that harm with the harm caused by taking away freedom. But it's, it's not simple. It's incredibly complex and so many of our problems stem from it. The cost to the state of implementing minimum unit pricing is estimated at two billion. And, that, and the estimated savings to wider society, including crime, the cost of the NHS, come in at around 200 million, which means we would be spending 1.8 billion on a policy which is not very effective. The media has um, suddenly have become obsessed with the amount of binge drinking in this country. And it's, it's putting pressure on the top people in our society to say, look, we need to do something about it, when in fact it hasn't risen that much. In fact, it's decreased 13% since 2004. And I'd just like to say we don't need a short-term policy to affect this when we've got such long-term policies, such as the Know Your Limits policy, which is taking effect now. It might have taken a little bit longer, but it is working, and the long-term policies are what matter rather than a short-term policy, which will unfairly and unjustly penalise parts of society. The reason why we support mineral alcohol pricing is because it works. And no, it isn't the state being showing the ultimate patriarchy. By It's the state fulfilling its duty of care towards the people. And if it can't do that, I don't know what society we live in.